welcome to Field Sports Britain. Coming up, the Grouse Whisperer, teaching game birds to sit and stay. What does a terrierman do? We unearth the facts and chase down the fiction. We have news with the man who bow hunted an 11 foot Mako shark and hunting YouTube with a lot more people with Prey Drive. First, let's go back 100 years to the First World War. This is a good book, Sniping in France by Major Hesketh Pritchard. It's got links to hunting, to shooting, and to me. The First World War echoes down the generations. Almost drowned out by the Second World War, the First's entrenchments, its senselessness, its tragic waste still has an effect on families, including mine. My mother's grandfather, Hesketh Pritchard, was a big game hunter, a journalist, a cricketer, an Edwardian superstar who blagged his way into the army with one aim in mind, to use his stalking skills in order to teach sniping. Well, this is a lot like uh, the BBC programme, Who Do You Think You Are? I've come to one of Britain's Imperial War Museums to find out more about Great Grandfather. Hesketh Pritchard went to the trenches first in 1915, escorting journalists. He took with him a number of sporting rifles. Brigades and battalions were soon applying to borrow them. If you were a soldier who was a good shot, you got extra pay and privileges, and uh, if you were a bad one, you could uh, look to get all the worst jobs in your company. So uh, there, was a, there was a value set on marksmanship, but individual marksmanship was not really uh, something that was to the fore. Uh, the Germans on the contrary, had a lot of soldiers who were uh, experienced at uh, hunting deer and boar and so on. So there were people experienced in that. And also Germany had a, a really good optics industry. Most of the optics in the world came from Germany. Pritchard started teaching sniping in October 1915 for the First Army and later for the Third Army. He soon set up the First Army Sniping School. Now you're holding his rifle, which I recognise because it used to be in a bedroom cupboard in uh, where I grew up. Why is it specifically a, a sniper rifle? Well, this one's slightly unusual in that obviously at the beginning of the war they adapted the rifles they had. Um, some hunting rifles went to front, Germans did the same, but really uh, they, they soon found that the best way to do it was to, to find a, a normal service rifle that was pro for accuracy and add uh, optical sights to it. And there's a lot of, uh, of talk about how he, he drew on the, particularly the Scottish regiments, which, which had uh, deer stalkers in their ranks, um, for, well, he says in his book actually mainly for the scouting rather than the, 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 the shooting. Yes, I think it's the field craft, yeah, that they knew how to make themselves invisible in a landscape. And as you can see behind me, the uh, sniper robe, uh, other people were at work, artists in many cases, who could assist in, in, in achieving that. And uh, this, this, this is so to enable a man to lie out in no man's land unseen. And if they weren't lying out somewhere between the lines, they would be somewhere in, the, in a sniper post in the cut into the, into the front of the trench. And uh, they would be looking out of the trench, you know, some hole in the trench parapet, which was carefully disguised using rubbish quite often. I've heard elderly relations say that seeing your victim through good quality sights, that murdering them really, contributed to Pritchard's early death in 1922. The doctors said it was an illness. I asked Paul what was the effect of sniping on those First World War snipers? Obviously the First World War is littered with incidents of people uh, in hot blood, killing people who are trying to surrender and so on. You know, it wasn't a very nice, pleasant war, you know, there wasn't much chivalry about it. The sniper is, you know, has to think about it uh, a lot. So how have the role and the equipment changed over the last 100 years? Well, training has increased from five days to nine weeks and clearly the kit has moved on, but not necessarily the mindset of the soldier. Sniping tends to find you, you don't find sniping. It attracts personalities who like to work on their own and they tend to go into that line of trade because of the person they are rather than any kind of benefits. There is definitely a benefit in not moving around. You don't want to move around in a group that makes more noise than two skeletons making love on a wriggly tin roof using a Coke can for a condom because they attract enemy fire. 
Putting aside tin can condoms, Andrew talks us through the modern day sniper rifle. His primary weapon has changed considerably. The First World War weapon was made out of wood and steel and was at the mercy of, of the elements. A modern sniper rifle is built out of stainless steel, synthetic stock materials or chassis materials like this, which are relatively impervious to hot, cold, wet and dry. This is a Barrett 98B, which is a modern modular rifle. First World War rifle, possibly two inches of, of accuracy at 100 yards. We would expect a rifle like this to stack bullets onto your thumbnail at 100 metres all day long, and, and typically they do. The optics from the First World War were maybe capable uh, at five power, and that's a very powerful First World War site, capable facial recognition at maybe 400 yards. Um, this is a modern five to 20 power optic, and this would give you facial recognition out to and beyond a kilometer. Uh, in the First World War, a sniper would very often have worked on his own. Uh, modern snipers very seldomly, if ever, work on their own. So you have two suites of equipment with each sniper. He'll have a primary weapon like this. He may well have a secondary weapon like an assault rifle with him. He's probably got a self-loading pistol. And uh, the number two will also have an assault rifle, more typically in 7.62. And that rifle on its own is capable of engaging targets out to between 800 and 1,000 metres. A modern sniper is more of a unit with an 80 pound Bergen rammed full of kit compared to the soldier out in no man's land with a bag full of luck. Well, the next stage of the story takes me to Flanders for a drive past the towns that make up much of the Western Front. The trenches moved agonisingly slowly towards Germany, but sniping moved on in leaps. Great grandfather says in his book, Sniping in France, written after the war, that the Germans started with the mastery then the British Expeditionary Force set about killing off the more dangerous German snipers and training its own men, at which, he says, the Germans went to ground, and so his snipers learned to become scouts. To achieve all that, he needed somewhere to set up his school of sniping. Well, Pritchard and his 2IC Grey took a car and drove speculatively around the Pas de Calais region, looking for somewhere to site their sniping school, rather as I've taken a car and driven retrospectively around the battlefields of northern France. They came to this village, Lingham. Up there were rifle butts on a big plateau. They went to have a look. Memories of the wars that have ravaged this landscape are all around. A few minutes outside Lingham, I come across an overgrown farm track that leads up to the old range. This is a bit like Jack and Ori. Grey and Pritchard came up here. Grey says, why? The place is trying hard to be like Scotland, because in those days it was covered in gorse and heather. It's changed a bit since then. I'm dying to see what it looks like now. I suppose I thought it would look like the pictures in Pritchard's book, an 800 yard open rifle range. It's not exactly what I expected. There's a lot more trees than the, uh, the picture, but there's lots to explore. Well, I found this, which is helpful. So it says after 1944, the woods grew up the place is now used for shooting and for, for walkers. Not at the same time, I guess. We actually, we disturbed a little roebuck on the way up here. During the war, 1943 to 1944, it was used as a site to launch the V1 rockets, which explains the blockhouse over there. Quite a lot of history has happened here since great-grandfather was here. Before 1943, it was used for artillery practice. And I have the bit here, what it was like 1916 to 1918. Here's an extract from his book. Beginning with a class of a dozen to 15 officers who were dealt with by two officer instructors, our classes grew until we had 25 officers and 40 or 50 NCOs at each course. But the actual teaching was only one side of the work of the school, for it was soon thoroughly known throughout the army that if any division, brigade or battalion wanted its telescopic sights tested, or if any individual sniper found himself shooting incorrectly, all that had to be done was apply to the First Army Sniping School. So this Pas de lot are very good at signage, especially considering it's a hunting area. Now I've got my photograph of the site here from 1915-1916 and here's a map we've come up this side here so that plane there is the wooded bit here 
We must have walked over Pritchard's old Armstrong hut that he stole. Amateur archaeology is fun. I spend a happy hour trying to find out where the hut must have been from the photo in his book. I must be standing on the, where the foundations in the picture are just here but they'll be completely overgrown and uh, I think the German V1 programme put paid to the Armstrong hut. Well he was in a very good position citing his sniping school here because over at that end of the view is Vimy Ridge which the Canadians famously fought and the first army forces and trenches, quite shallow trenches, stretched all the way to Arras over here. So he could look down on the battle raging right in front of him. And for every one British soldier he had up here, he had two Canadians. I think this is the point where the enormity, the crushing hopelessness of the First World War hits home. I'm at a training centre. Nobody gets killed here, but it feels like a fight has taken place. A fight that would go on to leafy Hertfordshire four years after the war with Pritchard's premature death that would create my granite-like great-grandmother, Pritchard's wife, whom I just remember from the 1970s, her children who seemed to live both in his shadow and bathed in his light. The First World War was not just about the people who died in France. An awful lot of people came up that road behind me. Pritchard writes in his book, I've often regretted I didn't keep a visitor's book at the First Army Sniping School, for certainly enormous numbers of visitors came to us. Outside the officers of the British Expeditionary Force, of whom several hundred visited the school, we had attaches and missions of various Allied neutral powers, Japanese, Romanian, Dutch, Spanish, American, Italian, Portuguese, Siamese and Polish officers, as well as large numbers of journalists. It's a funny thing, trampling over your ancestors, walking on where your great-grandparents have been. It's a bit, like, a bit like waiting outside the headmaster's office. You know something big and bad has happened and you're here to... you're here to feel that. And there's more because this area has seen so much in the last hundred years. It was Pritchard's sniping school, it was a, an artillery area, the Germans had their rockets here, and now it's a beautiful woodland. For Pritchard, it will always have been his greatest work, and it really is lovely to have seen it. Whoops. <laughs> Well, thank you to everyone who helped with the making of that film. The Imperial War Museum in London, they've got an excellent First World War exhibition on. Rifle craft in Suffolk is definitely worth a visit. And the Pas de Calais tourist office. Now, for someone who's no help to anyone, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. Bradford Council has voted to allow grouse shooting on its land on Ilkley Moor by just one vote. A group of anti-shooters has been campaigning to stop the Bingley Moor partnership manage the moor for shooting. The antis have started attacking the antis. Hunt saboteurs are organising a boycott of organic vegetable company Riverford after they spotted the South Devon Hunt hunting within the law on land owned by the pro-hunting sister of anti-hunting Riverford founder Guy Watson. A family driving past a hospital in Kent was surprised to see something more than litter on the grass verge. Sorry, right behind It's all right, just stop Just go here. forward like you would, I've got it on camera, go I'm filming on. it. I'm filming it, yeah. <laughs> this wild boar was munching away outside the new hospital at Pembury near Tunbridge Wells. Thank you for sending in the film. Skinner's Pet Foods has had an excellent year with its gun dog teams. The sponsor of this news bulletin also sponsors the England Gun Dog Team, which won the international gun dog event at the CLA Game Fair. It also sponsors the GB Hungarian Vizsla Team, which went to the European Championships in Austria in June. And it's even had time to launch some new products, Field and Trial Junior and Field and Trial Maintenance Plus, and Joint Aid for Dogs. A hunter has managed to fight off half a tonne of black bear as it mauled his face and his neck.
The bow hunter and his party had tracked the bear through dense swamp in Minnesota. The 525-pound black bear suddenly got up, clawing and biting the man. Incredibly, the seriously injured hunter stabbed the bear around 20 times with his knife, killing it. He now faces a lengthy stay in hospital with injuries to his face and two broken arms. And finally, a US TV show host has landed an 809-pound, 11-foot mako shark with a bow. Jeff Thomason presents the hunting show Predator Pursuit. He spent 30 minutes coaxing the shark towards the boat off the coast of Los Angeles in California. The fish was so heavy it needed five crew members to haul it back to shore. You are now to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the story, fishing for fat. Thank you, David. Now, some people find a lot of what we enjoy difficult to understand, and it's up to us to be open and honest about it. One role that's often in the firing line is the terrierman. So how come they get to race around the countryside, tooled up and on a quad bike? They get a poor press. Terrier men are not as glamorous as those good-looking lady masters in pink coats. They're not as elegant as the gents in rat catchers following behind, but without them the hunts could not operate. Martin Clark from Somerset has been a terrier man for more than 25 years. He started in the job with border terriers. Back in the sort of early 80s there weren't too many people working border terriers. Um, I like the fact that they're very, very loyal, very intelligent terriers, and their working ability was just, you know, second to none, to be honest with you. But then as the years sort of went by, this black fell terrier became quite popular. I changed over partly be be because I was finding that um, borders were getting a little bit expensive, and I sort of switched over and, you know, never looked back, to be honest with you. There are lots of excellent terriers. The ones we're using in the accompanying shots don't belong to Martin. They are Lakeland terriers. Today, with the laws and regulations, basically it's a terrier to go in and to bay furiously, you know, not to be too aggressive, not to get hold if possible, but just to yap and know when to back back. But equally, give that fox a little bit of jip so he'll flush out into the net or possibly to a, a waiting gun. Basically they're bred for yap, courage and sort of loyalty. Equally in some situations I can call the terriers out. It's a rural pest control service. With the antis out to get them, terriermen have to have a dead cert understanding of the difference between a fox's earth and a badger's set. But why does Martin reckon he is better at fox control than a gamekeeper with a lamp? It can be a little bit more selective than night shooting. We can be called out to an area where perhaps, you know, there'd been a lot of kills overnight and we can be a little bit more pacific and sort of check the earth, look for any signs of feathers and equally try and dispatch that individual that might be causing the, the, the problem rather than, you know, eliminate every fox in the district. Some gamekeepers are very appreciative of us being there, you know, after they've had a sort of 12 month on the beat and, you know, individual foxes have evaded them, but quite often, you know, surprises even then, they don't realise what they've got on their doorstep. So there you have it. The job of a terrierman is to bolt foxes. If you want to know more, have a look at the website of the National Working Terrier Federation, terrierwork.com. Well, I hope that is clear. Right, next, grouse. At this end of the season, they get unsurprisingly skittish. I've been off to see a man who can keep him calm while you carry on. At this time of year, the grouse are sitting pretty, taking flight only when the beating line or a dog's nose is too close for comfort. 
Later in the season, however, it's a different story. A grouse is wiser, scurrying as fast as its little legs will carry it through the heather at the sound of the first cartridge being slipped into the side by side. But fear not, a late walked up grouse day can still be a success thanks to some high rise kite flying. I'm in Scotland to meet author and kite pilot Alistair Robertson, who is going to walk me through the technique. The original kite that I came across was uh, came from Easter Elkies near Craig Alecky. And it was used for walking up grouse rather late in the season when the grouse were quite wild and you just wanted, you weren't beating or anything, you weren't having beaters or standing or anything. So you would have somebody in the line would go with this kite you have the wind behind you and you'd walk up slowly, preferably going up, slightly up the side of a hill, so you'd hope to grow to the other side, and they would see this hovering bird. And when they see that, they will not shift, they won't move. Well, they won't move immediately, but that gives you the chance, gives the dogs and you to get up to them. And actually, there are, there are, there are prints, old prints of this being done. Um, the only one I've seen, the only one I've actually seen is a Thorburn, which is actually with partridges. And in Salisbury Plain, they used to do it. Um, they used to shoot partridges under a kite. In fact, there is, I can't remember the name of the village, but there is a village where they got, they got the kite in the local museum there. And, um, but Grouse, I think there is another print. We'll, we'll see how it works. <laughs> it takes Alistair a number of attempts to get it up. No tittering in the cheap seats, please. But eventually, our aerobatic bird scarer is looking menacing enough to make any grouse rigid with fear. Alistair loves his Scottish sport and is the only person in the country who has a dedicated field sports column in a national paper. He's also written a book explaining the fundamentals of Scottish sport, such as why we burn heather and who owns the land and the rivers. I mean, anybody who do not have to be foreign would ask, one of the things you want to know is, well, how much does it cost to shoot a grouse? I mean, it's almost like a secret society if you want to know that sort of information. Where do you find it? You'll have to go plowing around Google. You'll find it. But it's not just that. Or how much, you know, can anybody catch a salmon? Uh, can you shoot game on a Sunday? Actually, the answer rather surprisingly is yes. <laughs> um, but you can't catch a salmon on a Sunday. As a perception, of course, this uh, shooting, uh, fishing and, uh, and stalking is extraordinarily expensive in Scotland. If I buy this book, am I going to get a sort of sense of getting some free grouse shooting? Uh, it, it'll certainly put you in the right direction for... for possibly not free grouse shooting, but it does, it particularly explains that everybody thinks of grouse shooting as being huge sums of money and people standing in rows and hundreds of beaters and all the rest of it. Well, of course, the truth Oi. is that probably more grouse shooting is done by just people plodding across heather, you know, a few friends with dogs and that sort of thing. Um, and it need not be at all expensive, and particularly, I mean, pheasant shooting, I mean, it's just people, I mean, you can, you, you can just go out and, and, you know, talk to a local farmer and walk up and down a hedgerow and everything for a few pounds, if perhaps nothing, perhaps a bottle of whisky. Whisky, another reason to visit Scotland. Right, back to the kite. Alistair explains that it is now easy to handle and, after a successful demo, we can now pack up. Unfortunately, landing the bird is not a textbook affair and it gets stuck in the tallest tree we can find. Back to the kite simulator for Alistair. If you would like to impress your friends by explaining the who's, when's and why's of Scottish sport, then Robertson's Guide to Field Sports in Scotland, Shooting, Fishing and Stalking Explained is available on Amazon or go to his website alistairrobertson.co.uk. It has happened to all of us. Right from kites up trees in Scotland to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Let's start with one of the mighties of YouTube. Hushin with Lavare is calling Big Bull Elk through the fog. It's a father-son bonding outing. Mainly interesting is the call they use for elk in the US. It is definitely the red rut all over the Northern Hemisphere. Here's how they call in red stags in the Ariageur Forest, which is on the French side of the Pyrenees. And here's how they call in red stags in Poland. Jakob Kaman sends in this film of a couple of hunts in two locations. 
mentioned. Unlike the others, this film is not on YouTube, but on Vimeo, a place as big and empty as where Jakob is in Poland. Hooked on Boars magazine, New Zealand's must-have monthly for the true hog hunter has its own TV show on Sky in New Zealand, starting in November 2014. Here is the trailer. That's all very well, but what about the rest of us? YouTube is where we go for the best boar hunting. The Catcher HD Hunting HD channel, so named in case you were in any doubt, offers this film of driven boar in Italy. Browning has a number of YouTube channels where it tends to put nature films, so it is good to see it putting out a proper pigeon shooting film, in this case to promote the A5 shotgun, its go anywhere semi-auto. Every year ducks migrate across North America and pressure group Ducks Unlimited provides an excellent service on YouTube predicting the migrations for the benefit of America's duck hunters. This week DUTV host Field Hutnell predicts migration activity in the Great Lakes region. And finally, want to know what the hunting dog scene is like in Mother Russia? Kazbek Bekoyev has put out this fun look at a local hunting dog show somewhere across the nine time zones. That's it for this week. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, send it in via YouTube or email me the link charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it. We're back next week. Please subscribe or go to our webpage, fieldsportschannel.tv. This has been Fieldsports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye.